the subject matter is going to be quite challenging and difficult. And so I would encourage, you know, uh, young ears to divert and go to the children's worship area. And for those that are staying, I would say even to you, this is a challenging message, something that I've had to really pray on and really seek the Lord's guidance in here. And some of the material we're discussing today is, is going to make you uncomfortable and is going to challenge you. Um, but I hope it is very enlightening to you and eye-opening to you. So if you would, turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. I'm not going to have you stand yet, and I'll have you stand in just a minute. But we're talking today about adultery and what the scripture has to say about adultery. In Exodus 20, verse 14, Moses was, well, this was written by Moses, but delivered by God to the people of Israel. Everyone heard it, this part of the Ten Commandments. And God said to the nation of Israel, he said, you shall not commit adultery. The culture in our Western world predominantly believes that moral truths are not absolute. In other words, they do not believe that some morals apply to everyone, everywhere, and at every point in history. Instead, they promote that everyone can determine what is morally true for themselves. In other words, what is true for you is true for you but it's not necessarily true for me. And although they may believe this intellectually and try to promote this and how they, you know, how they articulate themselves, but largely they do not live like this. In other words, when they themselves are wronged, suddenly they become moral absolutists. And the subject matter of adultery, murder, theft, and lying are perhaps the litmus tests for moral absolutes. I'll give you an example. Nelson believed that people could define what is true for themselves. What is true for them is true for them. Everyone has their own truth, he'd say. However, when Nelson's wife was caught in adultery, he was furious. How could she do this to me? And to us, he shouted. When he asked his wife, Harriet, why he did it, why she did it, she responded, well, my truth says it was okay for me. Of course, Nelson, given his worldview, he shouldn't be mad about it. She was just acting in her own truth, right? Yet he was still mad. Why was he still mad? Because he was faced with reality. The reality is there are certain moral truths that apply to everyone, everywhere, and at every given moment in history. B.W. Powers said this, The existence of adultery presupposes the existence of marriage. If there is no marriage, then there is no adultery. And of course, in any conversation that we need to have, we need to, de to define our terms. So what do we mean when we say adultery? And what do we mean when we say marriage? To give us a little background, what is marriage? How would you define marriage? I think Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 and 24 gives us a clear definition along with Matthew chapter 19, verse 5. God's design for marriage is this. The unity of one man and one woman for one lifetime. Notice the sequential one there. One, one, one equals one. <laughs> that math ain't mathin. A man shall leave his father and mother and cling or be united to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate from the scriptures. That's how we define marriage, but what is adultery? How would you define adultery? Well, adultery is simply this, the sexual interaction with anyone besides your spouse. 
the sexual interaction with anyone besides your spouse. Thus, adultery violates the one flesh mandate, right? One man, one woman for one lifetime, they are one flesh. And to add another who is not your spouse into that is a violation of the one flesh mandate. And marriage, given the culture of Israel during that time, was very important for the nation of Israel. It preserves the nation. It strengthens the nation. It allows the nation to continue. We talked about this when we discussed honor of the mother and father a couple weeks ago when we addressed that command. But our adultery was considered a grave sin in that culture, not just with Israel, but many other cultures as well. It was an awful sin in the eyes of God and the eyes of others. God designed sex to be for two purposes, procreation and pleasure. And it's to be confined to the marriage bed. That's what he designed. That's how he designed it. He designed us sexual creatures with those desires. But he put parameters on how we are to exercise those desires within the marriage partnership. So any sex outside of that marriage covenant is a sin. And so by implication, with this command against adultery, God was also condemning all other forms of sexual immorality. And he lists them more specifically in the law books, bestiality, premarital sex, extramarital sex, homosexual relationships, polygamy, polyandry, that's probably a new one, polygamy, multiple wives, polyandry, multiple husbands of one wife, and then polyamory, which is a new and upcoming thing these days, group marriages, multiple women, and multiple men. And they're all wrong because they violate this one command. Many people today and here today have firsthand experience with adultery and how it has wreaked havoc on your family, on your friends, your community, possibly your church. And we must recognize that adultery does not just happen out of the blue. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time. So the question is, what started the process? What started this sexual immorality? How did it originate and become what it was? And I think Jesus answered that question by taking it to the heart. Where does adultery start? It starts in the heart. So if you would, stand with me as we read scripture from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, this is Jesus' commentary and command about adultery. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Would you pray with me? Father, as we dive into your word today, God, in this very difficult subject, I pray you would fill me with your spirit to know what exactly to say and how to say it. Father, help me to be a vessel in your hands, to be your messenger this morning. Matter of fact, Lord, I ask that you would just set me aside, my own opinions and intentions, God, and you just use me as your vocal cords and your mouthpiece today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Before we get to the meat of this passage, I want to talk about two obvious lies that is often seen in reading this passage. The first lie is this. I am guilty, just by, if I am guilty just by thinking, thinking lustfully, then I might as well go ahead and commit the act. Lie number one. Obviously, you can see the faulty reasoning in that. Very simply... Thinking about murdering someone is very different than actually murdering them, right? 
one has much greater consequences than the other. In the same way, thinking lustfully about someone is much different than actually committing adultery. Would you agree? The consequences are much greater with the committing of adultery. Now, in the eyes of God, we're still guilty of both. We're still guilty in his eyes. But one has greater consequences. The act has greater consequences than the thought or the intention. Plus, to commit the act, we've committed two sins. The one in the heart and the one of the hand of the action. And why would we want to do that? We reap in double the, the consequences. But Jesus' intention here is if we catch the sin in the heart and we address it in the heart, then we will prevent the action. Jesus cares about the heart. Lie number two. Mutilating my body will prevent me from sinning. Right? Well, if my eye causes me to sin, I'll just gouge it out. If my hand causes me to sin, I'll just cut it off. Does that help? <laughs> Where do you sin in your heart? Where do you sin? Like, do you, does your eye cause you to think bad thoughts? Listen, if I close my eyes, I can imagine whatever I want. I don't need my eyes to imagine things. Now, things that I see can influence what I think. But Jesus is not talking about mutilating the body. What he was using a hyperbole here, an exaggeration to prove a point. We don't need to cut off our, eye, cut our, cut off our hand and gouge our eyes out to prevent sinning. We need to address it in our heart. But what he is addressing is the dramatic sacrifices that we need to be willing to make to eradicate sin from our lives. Did you hear that? What Jesus was emphasizing is the dramatic sacrifices we need to be willing or need to actually make in order to eradicate or get rid of the sin in our lives. And we need to do so immediately. Especially when it comes to sexual sin, it is invasive. It holds no punches. It is strong. And it needs to be eradicated. It doesn't, it's not something that you need to be weaned off of. It is something that needs to be stopped and it needs to be stopped immediately. Amen? Y'all kind of quiet. That's all right. So if not our actual eyes and hand, then what exactly do we need to eliminate to prevent sexual temptations? What do we need to eliminate to prevent sexual temptations? Number one, very simply, eliminating tempting situations. Eliminating tempting situations. What would you be willing to eliminate in your life if it, came, if it became a tempting situation for you? Jesus highlighted the eyes and the hand, but what if we substituted eyes and the hand for other things that may cause us or exacerbate sins in our life? Things like TV, movies, entertainment, how about radio and music, how about social media, magazines, smartphones and other devices. These things can be powerful tools in the hands of the devil. If being on TV or on your cell phone or tablet late at night causes you issues, and you know what I'm talking about, I'll make it clear in just a minute. If that causes you issues, are you willing to get rid of it? Are you willing to get rid of it? Are you willing to get rid of the item in your life? Maybe the TV, maybe the cell phone, maybe the device, maybe the situation you need to get rid of. If you're not able to get rid of the actual device or something, well... Because sometimes it may be impractical, especially in today's world, to get rid of a cell phone or a tablet or, or something like that. Your work may require it. Um, but are you willing to accept some accountability for someone to ask you the tough questions, for someone to get in your business, so to speak? Say, hey, how you doing when you're all by yourself? What are you looking at? What are you thinking about? For someone to get into your business. Why? Because it is a tempting situation. And we got to be honest with ourselves about it. And seek some help. Sometimes you can do it by yourself. Between you and the Lord. But other times you may need to seek some help. Matter of fact, here's a practical one. There is an organization called Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes. It's an organization that 
will actually help you. It's a community online that will help people that are dealing with struggles with sexual temptations online, and they will keep you accountable, even put blocks on your devices so that you can't access certain sites. Let me ask you this, moms and dads, would you give your teenager or your preteen an assault rifle without first giving them some instructions and some restrictions and some guidance on how to use it? Some of you would be like, I ain't giving them an assault rifle at all. And you would be wise. How about a BB gun? Would you give them a BB gun without any instructions or, wi or wisdom or, or guidance, restrictions of how to use it and when to use it and how to have proper maintenance of it? No. But yet so many families give an even greater weapon, the Internet, with free access to everything on demand whether it be through laptops, through devices, through cell phones, through social media, whatever their imaginations can envision, they can search. And it's a, it's a horrible thing. It's a, it's a dishonorable thing. But we have to, as parents, as leaders, we have to set some boundaries for our kids if we genuinely care about them. We are sexual beings, and sexual opportunities run rampant in our culture. And the tempter, Satan himself, has a firm grasp on how powerful sexual temptations are, and he knows how to press it. He knows how to use it to ruin people's lives. And he has so many tactics to get us to fail. He tries to numb our sensitivity to moral sexual sins. Ah, oh, it's not that bad. Ah, oh, it's okay to look, don't touch. And there's a, it's a slow, methodical process to get us to numb ourselves to the point where we don't feel the pain of the sexual temptation anymore, and we readily become friends with it and then fall for it. It's a slow, grinding process. And he's very good at it, the devil is. I've heard it said before, for married, unmarried couples, he will often tempt them to take their clothes off. But for the married couples, he tempts them to keep their clothes on. Satan wants to completely flip the script from God's design to excite sexual arousal outside the marriage, but shut it down within the marriage. Of course, I understand marriage is much more than about sex, but for today's subject matter, we are talking specifically about sexual immorality. And one of the most influential and evil ways Satan has weaseled his way into destroying so many relationships within the church and without the church is through pornography. I know this is going to make many of you uncomfortable today. This is such a big problem, and I cannot avoid talking about it just simply because it's uncomfortable. We cannot avoid it. Because by avoiding it, we're not addressing it. And just to show you how big of a problem it is, here's some stats. 55% of adults, 25 and older, believe porn is wrong. That means 45% of adults, 25 and older, think it's okay. Is that a problem? I'll show you how much of a problem it is. Nine out of ten boys, six out of ten girls, are exposed to pornography online before the age of 18. Is that, is that a problem? Ninety percent of teens and 96 percent of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about porn with their friends. And 71% of teens have done something to hide their online activity from their parents. Are these shocking to you? 57% of teens search out porn at least monthly. 51% of male students, 32% of females, 
first viewed porn before they were teenagers. One in five youth pastors, 20%, one in seven senior pastors, use porn on a regular basis or are currently struggling. Tell me it's not a problem. 43% of senior pastors and youth pastors say they have struggled with pornography in the past. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say they watch porn at least once a month. We can't avoid talking about this. It's invasive, it's wrong, and it's destructive. 68% of divorce cases involved one party meeting a new lover over the internet. And 56% involved one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. 56% of divorces have that underlier, pornography. Let me tell you what porn does. Porn creates unrealistic expectations about sex. Unrealistic expectations about sex. And it trains misogynistic thinking. In other words, it degrades women. Porn desensitizes people into sexual violence. And in some cases, porn can even lead to sexual dysfunction because they may have unrealistic expectations about sex and then when faced with reality, it doesn't match up. We are living in an age that glamorizes sex and calls pornography art. And so many even progressive Christians they're not Christians, by the way, but they call themselves progressive Christians. They would label pornography as art. It's not wrong. We are called to purity, my friend. We need to recognize that porn is absolutely wrong. And this goes for movies. It goes for TV shows. It goes for pictures and magazines and videos and social media or any other medium that it may come through. And it also includes soft-grade porn, which may not be explicit, but it's certainly explicit enough that your mind can fill in the blanks. Catching my drift. Are you tracking this morning? It needs to get out of our lives, church. It needs to get out of our lives immediately. It's not something we flirt with, not something we tangle with, not something we, we need to tolerate it is something we need to eradicate you remember the story of joseph and potiphar's wife what did joseph do when faced with that sexual temptation with potiphar's wife ran he ran he wasn't playing around with it many of us need to run and our church family let me be honest with you porn started to grab a foothold in my life when i was a very young age before I was a teenager. And I, I learned that it was absolutely wrong. But it started because it was free and it was easy to access. And it actually started as soft grade, viewing nudity on certain movies where my mind could fill in the blanks. And it progressed from there. It also was enhanced because of certain people I was hanging around with at the time. Again, I was 11, 12 years old. And it's happening even younger and younger today. And it's hard. I'm so glad that the Lord convicted me of it even as a young age, a young Christian. And he pulled me out of it. I got rid of those friends, started hanging around with other people that were better influences on me. The Lord grabbed a hold of my heart and convicted me that it was wrong because I fell for the lie that you can look and not touch. Because I heard somebody tell me that. And I tell you, my friend, it's possible to overcome, but it's also difficult. 
And you won't forget some of those images. They're very warping. And porn today has been made so easy and so easy to access for free everywhere you look. And it can change, literally change, the chemical balances within your mind. Studies are showing that porn gives men a new standard of beauty. Unrealistic. Men don't just view porn. They actually picture themselves as part of the experience. They enter into it, as one study said. And the more someone watches porn, they, their mind, if you look at it under a CT scan or MRI, it actually begins to look like an addict's mind. It begins to be shaped and molded chemically as that of a heroin addict. And it begins to make you think that you cannot survive without it. It is powerful. No wonder it's destroying people. No wonder it's destroying marriages. No wonder, and, and if we're not careful, it can destroy churches. And as you see, so many churches are hitting the news now with pastors and leaders falling to sexual sins. Y'all seen that? I can't say that it has to do with pornography. I don't know that for sure. But you see the power of sexual drives and sexual temptations and sins that are running rampant even within the church. And it's, and it's creating a bad taste in the lives of unbelievers saying, well, look at the church. Look what they do. Look what their leaders do. Of course, Satan's going to try to use it to trip up the church, the children of God, to taint the name of the church. And if we're not careful, we can fall fall for it too. I'm so thankful that the Lord rescued me and I allowed for that conviction very early. I was only involved with it for probably two years of my life. It was a, a dark time in my walk, in my journey. Even as a young age, I accepted Christ when I was six years old. But when I got to be 11 or 12 was when I really took a turn because I was faced with a lot of Sexual challenges, my body was changing, going through puberty, not blaming that, but that just exacerbated the issue. And then coupling that with the wrong company at the wrong time, coupling that with not having many restrictions on things that I was viewing, it led me down this road. It's a dangerous lie. And my friend, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to tell you from my personal experience, if you're struggling, seek help. I'll be glad to talk with you. I'm glad to help you. Sometimes you may not be able to do it on your own. Matter of fact, it's not, Satan's going to try to encourage you to try to do it on your own. Because he knows without the support of friends, you're most likely to fall again. I had my accountability partners. I had my prayer partners. I had people asking me the tough questions. And I tell you that, through the power of God, God rescued me from that. Number two, not only getting rid of the, tech, the tempting situations, we need to get rid of tempting people. What do you mean by this? Is your marriage valuable to you? How, how valuable is it? If it's not, it should be. Because it was a covenant you made between you and God and your spouse. And of course, I want to make clear I'm talking to believers here. And there ought to be barriers in our relationships with others because of that. There has to be boundaries in our relationships with others because we have bound ourselves to one person. Husbands and wives, would it be okay if you allowed your spouse to look at your internet searches? Would it be okay if you allowed your spouse to see your social media followers, your social media chats, your text conversations, your phone call history, your bank account or credit, credit card accounts and transactions? We 
Listen, church, there simply may be people in our lives that we just need to push away because they're tempting for us, and that's okay. We have to set our boundaries and prevent problems. We have to be vigilant and be aware that the emotional connections that we have with people can often be the start of adultery, that emotional connection. We've got to set boundaries. Because that uh, adultery and affairs, they happen over time. And if you're not married, protecting another person's marriage should also be a priority to you. As a believer in Christ who is single, you need to be very guarded with someone who may express some interest in you but is married. That needs to be shut down immediately. Sometimes you may not know if that person's married. Do your research. Ask some tough questions of them. Because people often lie, and I can understand that, but we do our due diligence the best way we know how. Maybe you're in the dating world, and your date expresses to you that they want to have premarital sex. I'm just going to put my foot down here. Get out of that relationship. That person ain't for you. Amen? 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 However, there may be others that we have to be around because we can't avoid them. Maybe they're a neighbor, a co-worker, teammate, classmate, whatever. And so avoiding them may not be quite so easy. So what do you do in those situations? I want to give you four things so that we can keep ourselves and our marriages protected. Real quick. Number one, we need to pray for strength. We pray for strength. Pray for strength and for vigilance. That God would give us the power to resist temptations. And and number two, we need to recruit some accountability. Recruit some accountability. We need to ask someone, hey, this person that I have to be around regular is a challenge for me. I need you to keep me accountable. I'll give you access. You can see my text messages. You can see my my conversations. You, You know, I will be honest with you. I need you to ask me every once in a while how I'm doing. I need you to ask me those tough questions on with this person, how I'm doing. And I promise to be honest with you. Recruit some accountability. Number three, establish boundaries and standards. Boundaries in relationships, your own personal standards of purity. We have to establish those with regard to other relationships. Like, I will not do this with this person. I don't need to be texting this person. I don't need to be alone with this person. I don't need to be having any kind of communication with this person unless it is absolutely necessary. Number four, communicate with your spouse. That open communication builds that bond and being honest with one another. That's a tough one. I want to finish here, and I know I'm kind of going long, but this is so important. I want to finish talking about to you, with you of couples and families who may have experienced adultery themselves. Adultery is not an unforgivable sin. Please understand that. Adultery is not an unforgivable sin. God forgives and he no longer holds those guilty who have come to him in repentance and faith. And although adultery is a biblical, biblical reason to divorce, divorce is not mandatory in cases of adultery. God allows it, but it's not mandatory. In fact, reconciliation and restoration and forgiveness is preferable. I know many, I know many couples that have been able to reconcile who have gone through adultery. But those emotional wounds, they remain. Those scars, they remain. And it takes time to heal. Because adultery breaks that trust. And once trust is broken, it's difficult to gain it back. And time, they say time heals all wounds. I would disagree. God is the one who does the healing. And we need his help. If you are the one who has committed adultery, can I speak to you just for a minute? Have you confessed and repented? If you have, praise God, because he no longer holds you guilty for that. 
If you truly are a believer in Christ, your sin is wiped clean. If you have not repented, if you have not confessed, I would say this to you. Even if you have or you claim to be a Christian, I want you to heed these words from Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not enter the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither,ly neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters or adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy persons, nor drunkards or slanderers or swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. What Paul is pointing out here is those who have not repented are not genuinely saved. So even though you may believe the right things, if you continue to habitually practice these sins and not repent, Scripture is very clear. You're not saved. If you are the spouse of someone who has committed adultery, if you are the spouse of someone who has committed adultery, of one who has committed adultery, you must forgive. What? I can't forgive them. See what they did to me? You must forgive. Scripture is very clear. As Christians, we have no right to withhold forgiveness. No matter how hard it is, no matter how close to home it is, no matter how difficult it is or how painful it is, we have no right to withhold forgiveness because Christ has forgiven us. Amen? What do you mean by forgiveness? I mean we need to release the resentment. I mean we need to release the grudges and abandon those grudges and relieve the guilt of the other person. In other words, in our minds, we no longer hold them guilty. Because Christ does not hold us guilty. And this is especially true if your spouse comes to you with apologies to relieve those, that guilt that they may feel. And we leave it to the Lord. However, please don't mishear me. Forgiveness is primarily internal within the believer, which means that the adulterer may still have to face the external consequences of divorce. Divorce is still possible in cases of adultery, but it depends on the couple, on the situation. That's between the couple and the Lord. But we have no right as believers to hold grudges and resentment and bitterness towards someone. We release that to the Lord. And, we, and frankly, somebody, or let me tell you, we have to do that regularly. It's not a one and done thing. It's something we have to continue to do. That attitude of forgiveness. Adultery is a slow fade in a relationship. And perhaps the marriage bond had been fading for a while before, before the actual adultery came to. So, on both parties, there needs to be some self-reflection and some honest conversation of how did this come about. So maybe both parties need to repent to some degree or another. Reconciliation is possible, but it needs to be approached with humility, with an attitude of repentance and forgiveness. I know that's hard. Because sin runs deep, my friends. And the consequences of sin can be severe. But even if we have sinned against another person, like in the case of adultery, we need to ultimately seek forgiveness from God. He is the primary one we have sinned against. Of course, that does not mean that we need to hide it from our spouse. They deserve to know. David recognized this. King David recognized this after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then followed that with killing her husband. He was approached 
finally by the prophet Nathan, and David wrote Psalm 51 in response to that conversation. I'm going to give you some words from this psalm. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right with, in your verdict, and justified when you judge. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken heart, a contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. The proper response to our sin, regardless of what the sin is, is to humbly bow our knee to a Father who is ready to forgive. Amen. I preach this message to believers today. But there may be some listening to this message that have not received Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the place to start. Because it doesn't matter about trying to get your life right or get your marriage right or trying to correct your own path. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, none of that means anything. Establish the relationship with Christ. Why? Because it's the first step in growing toward Him First step towards actual forgiveness and restoration. Another practical reason, he alone has the power to help you overcome that sin in your life. Receive Christ by committing and surrendering yourself to him today. Maybe some of you have been challenged by this message and you need to confess and repent. Use this time now to do that. I'm not sure how the Lord may be speaking to you. Maybe you need me to pray. Maybe you need to come up here and pray. You deal with the Lord how he's dealing with you. Don't leave this silent. Let's stand as we pray. Father, thank you so much for your words today. And I thank you for the power of salvation. And I thank you for your grace, God. And forgiving us even when we certainly do not deserve your forgiveness. When we deliberately rebelled against you. And Father, I'm sorry for what I've done. And God, I pray that you'd help me to have a distaste for the things that you hate. Because God, I want to hate the things you hate and love the things you love. And I pray the same thing for this church that we would get on board with loving you with everything that we have and hold nothing back. You bring conviction on our hearts today. And I pray for those that have not received you as their personal Lord and Savior, they would come and bow before you and submit their lives to following you. In Jesus' name, amen.